Um, I want to welcome you all to what I think is going to be a great discussion this morning of the Scaling Up Nutrition, or Sun Movement, uh, where it has come from and, and where it's headed. Um, and we have a great, great group of panelists to, to learn from and with. Um, my name is Reed Hamill, and I'm a senior fellow with the Global Food Security Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, and it's my privilege to be joined today uh, by three expert panelists, Asma Latif, Denise Leonetti, and Carolyn Hart, each of whom uh, brings a wealth of Frontline's experience to bear on today's subject matter. So we'll make sure to leave ample time for questions and conversation. Um, I see we have a number of additional uh, experts in the room today, which is wonderful. Um, we also want to acknowledge our online audience. And so while we unfortunately are not able to field questions uh, from online, uh, I would encourage everyone uh, in the room and online to join the, the conversation on Twitter. Um, so, but before we delve into that conversation, I just want to take a few minutes uh, to talk about the new report that we're here to launch today. Um, what can the United States learn uh, from the Scaling Up Nutrition Sun Movement, uh, examining country leadership in Zambia, Kenya, and Bangladesh? So I need to start by extending immense appreciation to the report's three authors, um, T Rebecca Brown, Tamson Walters, and, and Jane Keylock, who are not here with us in person today, but I hope may be watching online. Um, the authors are partners at Nutrition Works, which is a UK-based international nutrition technical and research group. Uh, it was really a pleasure to work uh, with them on this process uh, in this project and to draw from their experience supporting Sun Movement uh, progress around the world as well. Um, so, and then finally, I want to thank my colleague Jillian Locke for always being so on top of uh, all the details throughout these collaborative processes uh, and for making sure that we ha indeed have this beautiful product to share with all of you today. So thank you, Jillian. Uh, so about that product. Um, with this report, we really wanted to highlight the good work of the Sun Movement for a broad audience here in DC that may be less familiar with its origins and its momentum, uh, which will be important to sustain after so much groundwork has now been laid over these past seven years. So the movement was launched in 2010 to weave together a global nutrition community of practice and network of networks, as Asma, I think, will tell us more about. Um, it focused on the high social and economic burdens of malnutrition and on interventions, especially within the first thousand days of life, uh, to arrest stunting trends worldwide. And uh, Sun recognizes that this multi-sectoral approach uh, and a deep appreciation for local context are really both essential to achieving those gains at scale. So, of course, undergirding the application of local knowledge is local and national political leadership and ownership of nutrition policy with governance very much front and center. The idea here is not a, a UN or a donor push, but really a country pull, and that pull, I think, we've seen uh, to be quite successful. The Sun Movement has grown to a movement of 59 member countries along with two Indian states today. Meanwhile, the United States has, of course, also been a, a long leader in tackling uh, the global burden of malnutrition uh, as the most generous nutrition donor in the world. And if you open up your reports and turn to page six, uh, you'll find here uh, data that, that we pulled from IFRI's Global Nutrition Report on disbursements uh, of 13 donors in 2012 and 2014. Um, U.S. leadership in both championing, but also in investing in the health and the human development and the economic benefits of nutrition programming is really unrivaled. But I do also want to clarify that these figures encompass both nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive disbursements. And for the U.S., the latter really does make up the lion's share. So nutrition-specific disbursements are, are under 10% of that total. Um, it's also worth noting that the methodology used here for U.S. spending is different from that applied to other donors, uh, which all draws from the Sun uh, donor network methodology. So it would be great uh, if we could have a little bit more of an apples to apples comparison with, with U.S. numbers on that as well. Uh, and I think that's, that's one point that the report goes on to make in terms of data streamlining. 
Um, so then the Sun Movement brings all the right stakeholders to the table, uh, and the U.S. government uh, brings a great deal of technical expertise and resources, and so the partnership potential here is really obvious, or I guess much more than potential, um, and that's what we really wanted to explore in the discussion uh, that follows throughout the report. So the analysis draws on experiences and observations primarily from three Sun countries, from Zambia, Kenya, and Bangladesh. Um, and I had the opportunity to spend a week in Zambia with one of the authors this spring, and I have to say that what we observed there was really very impressive. So Zambia was an early joiner of Sun back in 2010. And the commitments of government representatives, of civil society partners, um, across not just the, the health sectors, but WASH, education, child protection, community development, um, they really were striking there and at the district level. Um, in 2013, the government of Zambia pledged to have stunting uh, within 10 years at the Nutrition for Growth Summit, and we really just wanted to go and, and check in and, and see how they were doing and how that, how that progress was uh, unfolding. So the first phase of SUN implementation in Zambia largely fell within the first 1,000 Most Critical Days program, which was piloted in 14 districts. And uh, Zambia had also already created a, a really multi-sectoral governance structure uh, with a nutrition committee comprised of 10 line ministries that was set up at cabinet level. So they, they really did um, demonstrate that, that political leadership. Um, and then on the donor side, a, a Sun Fund uh, of pooled resources was set up, which I understand to be somewhat unique, but I think that there are those of you in the room who know more about this than I do. Um, so then the line ministries were able to apply for funding at the district level from the pooled uh, sort of coffers of resources. And, and that has some created some uh, that has created some some management challenges. Um, but I think that uh, everyone that we spoke with on the ground was very very candid uh, and thinking about ways to streamline that process going forward. So it's a work in progress, but um, but the progress made already is, is quite uh, self evident. So. The Sun Fund, I should say, in the first phase in Zambia, uh, drew $27 million of pooled investments from donors uh, between 2013 and 2016, and they had a, a donor base at that time of just three donors. So they're looking to double that uh, in, in the next phase, and, and, and we hope that they're able to do so. Um, unfortunately, on the domestic resource mobilization side, it doesn't look quite so good. So the rhetorical commitment was to increase nutrition spending uh, by 20% each year, but after a 35% increase in that first year from 2013 to 2014, public revenue flows have, have really stagnated for nutrition. Uh, in 2015, which was the peak budget year, the government spent just about 50 cents per child under five on nutrition-specific interventions. Um, I should note that that figure does not include substantial increases in human resources investments. So the government uh, created 500 new nutritionist positions at both national and district levels, which is laudable, but then recruitment for those positions to fill those positions has been difficult, and the report gets into some of the challenges with the, uh, the pipeline supply of qualified technicians uh, and how to really address that from a, from a systems uh, perspective. So it brings together this supply side sort of systems analysis with statistics and evidence on the costs and the benefits of uh, expanding key nutrition interventions. For example, in Kenya, the World Bank estimates that scaling up 11 key nutrition interventions would cost $76 million uh, in both public and donor investments annually, but it would save 5,000 lives each year and prevent nearly 700,000 cases of stunting. But Beyond that, it could further increase economic productivity by over $450 million a year over the productive lives of those beneficiaries. So that's $76 million outlay, $458 million return, uh, which is, I think, a pretty good business proposition. Uh, the return on nutrition investments in other cases has been estimated to be even higher in different contexts, as I think uh, you probably are familiar with. So the report draws also from some new research that seeks to further disentangle the contributions of various proximal and distal determinants of malnutrition um, to stunting outcomes, and it pulls 
other relevant trends such as the growth in social protection investments into that narrative as well. And we know that some of those investments uh, can also be uh, nutrition sensitive. It, finally, it really emphasizes the central importance of good governance, which is a point I wanted to circle back to. So uh, it explores national political ownership of malnutrition, for example, in Bangladesh's country investment plan uh, and the domestic resources that that plan is able to mar marshal in that context, uh, which our program has also written about previously. So the recommendations that it elevates for the U.S. government, I think, are all pretty straightforward and common sense, but no less important. Critical nutrition sensitive technical areas include those where USAID does have a great depth of ex expertise and experience, uh, including, for example, water sanitation and hygiene, nutrition sensitive agriculture, and private sector engagement. Um, so those recommendations include better sharing of programmatic and financial data and technical expertise in those domains uh, and the continued application of these types of structural systems approaches to support and advance country level leadership and ownership uh, as well as research and evaluation capacity. Um, so it draws on good examples of where that is already working well, and I think there are many places where that is working well, and credit is due, um, and also suggests some models that could be emulated elsewhere. So the big picture here, if you walk away uh, from this morning with one thing, is, is this, which is that Sun has really done a lot of legwork globally over the last seven years, and it has learned a lot uh, in that first phase. And so now is really the time for its forward momentum to be identified and leveraged by the United States as an opportunity for savvy investments with very solid returns. So the report comes at an opportune moment, of course, here in Washington amidst congressional budget appropriations for next year. Um, the House has appropriated about $49 billion uh, for, for foreign affairs, which is about $10 billion less than last year's or this year's enacted levels. Uh, and the Senate numbers have come out a little bit higher. Um, perhaps we can unpack that uh, in today's discussion. On the ag side, we do see roughly consistent funding for both Food for Peace and for McGovern Dole programming, both of which uh, support nutrition as well. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because I really want to make sure we have time for a great conversation with such such wonderful panelists. Um, and I'd like to invite um, uh, our three panelists up here on the stage, please, or on the dais. Good morning again to you all, and thank you for being here. Um, so we will start uh, by hearing from Asma Latif on her experiences, I think focused mostly on, on the role of civil society and, and Sun's uh, momentum so far. Thank you very much, Reed, and I'm really excited to be here today. This is, I think, the first public event on Sun. Um, over the many years here in Washington. So uh, it's great to be here and to, to be able to um, really look, look at what men, many of the accomplishments of the Sun Movement over the years and then uh, unpack some of the challenges, as, as you mentioned. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sun Civil Society Network. Um, I think it's, it, there are... Um, a lot of uh, the, there are a lot of accomplishments of the civil society network, and it's a relatively unknown um, part of the Sun Network, a uh, Sun uh, movement. So I thought it might be useful to spend some time looking at the role of civil society. Right from the very beginning, civil society was very much engaged in establishing Sun. I think seizing on the Lancet um, recommendations and really engaging with the World Bank, with USAID, um, civil society really helped push and, and um, mobilized um, interest among donors to support the Sun Movement. And, and so the Sun Movement, right from the beginning, was seen as a, a network of networks, if you will, and, um, and, and uh, trying to foster collaboration across sectors. And so in addition to the civil society network, there's a business network, a um, Sun country network, a donor network, a UN network as well. And so the idea is that these networks work together in countries um, to mobilize resources and improve policies and um, impact of nutrition. 
The Civil Society Network is, um, was established in 2013, um, around the time of the Nutrition for Growth Summit. It is, a, um, it is run by a steering committee that is an, uh, elected, and the steering committee reflects um, uh, the membership of the Civil Society Network, which is in INGOs, international NGOs, as well as civil society alliances in Sun countries. Reed mentioned there are now 59 Sun countries. Each, uh, 39 of those have civil society alliances. Um, so the, man, so the net network really is bringing together these civil society alliances and international NGOs that are supporting nutrition and sun um, more broadly. So today, there are more than 2,000 um, organizations that are part of the civil society network. And over the years, um, the civil society network has actually uh, grown dramatically since 2013. There were, in 2013, there were 11 civil society alliances, and now there are 39. Um, and these alliances, as well as the, the network as a whole, have um, really engaged at the, at the national level to support national uh, nutrition plans. Um, the Sun Movement is very much about a common results framework, so all the networks are really pushing towards the same goals, including the Civil Society Network. And um, so the Civil Society Alliances and the Civil Society uh, Network as a whole have been really engaging governments, donors on um, on nutrition, the first phase, uh, the first phases of first phase of um, the network was really raising awareness and getting the political will um, in country. And I think that the fact that 59 countries have signed up to the Sun Movement is an indication of some of the work that civil society did to educate governments and uh, donors about. Um, the impact of malnutrition um, in, on economic growth, the return on investment, um, all of you know, a, a lot, a lot of the research that uh, was there in the Lancet and the World Bank um, was, you know, civil society used that effectively to really make the case for nutrition. Um, the the network itself is run by a small secretariat. So, um, which is really staffed by three people and, um, and uh, is accountable to the steering committee. So three people are really sort of managing a network of 2,000 organizations. So um, it's been lean and it's been uh, for, that, for the level of investment in civil society. I think the impact uh, so far has been really very strong. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how um, uh, uh, some of the achievements of the network and civil society alliances. Um, some of them are reflected in the report, but um, uh, civil society alliances, um, the, the fact that there are now alliances in 39 countries um, suggests that uh, the civil society is less fragmented on the issue of nutrition. In many countries, prior to the creation of an alliance, civil society actors were doing their own thing in a, in a relatively uncoordinated way. And what the alliances have uh, managed to do is bring together a very wide array of stakeholders reflecting um, smallholder agriculture, health groups, gender groups, um, human rights groups, and others, um, to bring them to the table and speak as one voice um, for civil society. And I think in, in a wide variety of countries, Bangladesh, Laos, others, civil society has become a more effective partner for government because of the alliance. So that's, um, that's one um, achievement over the last several years. In, in Zambia, for example, um, civil society has really done a lot to engage parliamentarians and broaden the, um, the set of champions for nutrition beyond um, the government, um, beyond the, um, the administration in Zambia to parliament. And, and there is now a parliamentary caucus on nutrition 
and that both um, is raising, you know, building champions, raising um, awareness and um, the demand for nutrition within Parliament, but then the issue of accountability is also there, the oversight function of Parliament in that. Um, in Zambia, Zambian civil society um, also really did a great job of educating journalists and training journalists about how nutrition is critical to Zambia's long-term economic growth. And um, for a time, um, the head of the civil society um, uh, alliance in Zambia had a regular um, byline in the local paper on nutrition. And so th those are some ways. In Kenya, the Civil Society Alliance pushed for uh, a revision of the health of health policy because the nutrition was not adequately reflected in that. In Peru, um, the Civil Society Alliance pushed for um, uh, checkups for um, babies, infants, and young children as part of a conditional cash transfer program, and that resulted in a 40% reduction in malnutrition. So there are, so civil society has both been pushing to raise awareness about the importance of nutrition, to push for um, funding, but also um, to push for uh, policy change. Um, at the global level, the Sun Network really helps bring that civil society voice in Sun Country to the global conversation. And um, the Sun Network as a whole has really helped engage in global advocacy around the World Health Assembly targets around SDG, um, including uh, nutrition within the SDGs. Uh, nutrition is now tar uh, uh, target 2.2 in the zero hunger goal. Um, it, the civil society, uh, Alliance joining with the International Coalition for Advocacy on Nutrition and other um, groups have really pushed for um, a greater focus at the G7, the G20, the World Bank. There's been, um, we, the Sun Civil Society Network has been um, actively engaging uh, the World Bank in the human, uh, in the early um, childhood development work and really highlighting the role of nutrition in all of that. Um, it's really great to see the World Bank really putting nutrition at the center of its work on um, economic growth and development and you know, really positioning nutrition as a key piece of building the gray matter infrastructure and that's also happening at the African Development Bank. So the network as a whole is engaging in the global issues but then there's been a lot of action at the country level um, in the 39 countries where there is a civil society alliance. I just want to flag, and I don't know how much time I have, but I just You're want fine. to flag a few um, challenges um, that, that lie ahead uh, and that civil society has been um, sort of grappling with. Um, in a lot of these countries, setting up the civil society alliance was not easy. Um, you know, the, it, we were setting up an organization that re needed a governance structure, needed, uh, uh, you know, to understand laws, the financial bookkeeping, all of those sort of nuts and bolts that you don't really think about um, as being really uh, um, important. But in, in, in that context, when you're bringing people together, you really do have to, um, you know, when you're creating something new, you need to pay attention to those details. Those also take time and and thing and mistakes can happen. And so you have to work, figure out um, how to deal with those things. So the capacity building of the organization and then um, the capacity building in terms of advocacy, in terms of budget analysis, in terms of how, how do you engage uh, government, uh, all of those things uh, have been sort of happening at the same time, and and the issue of time is really important. It just it takes time for all of these things to uh, to develop the foundations, but then also um, 
for civil society to learn. So one of the functions that the network really has been playing is that peer-to-peer -peer learning across uh, civil society alliances. And there's a tremendous demand for that peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, they are, you know, there's a, uh, an eagerness to uh, um, adapt and innovate uh, learning from what's already working in, in a particular country context. So the Sun Movement and um, the Civil Society Network have hosted a, a few learning events um, over the last year in Rwanda, in Indonesia, and in um, Nepal. And um, so that's, that's an area where I think there's a lot of demand and need. But these things take a lot of resources, and it's not easy. I mean, I'm, I, I sit on the steering committee, um, and we meet monthly. And it's really challenging, just the logistics of getting civil society alliances in country to be able to have the connectivity to be able to dial in for that call. So these are, these are just logistical things that I think we take very much for granted here but they are really key to the effectiveness of, of these civil society alliances. Um, this, as I mentioned, the Secretariat is tiny. There are 59 countries and only 39 civil society alliances. There's a lot of work to be done to build up civil society in other, other Sun countries. But this year, um, the civil society network and many of the alliances were in a huge financial uh, crisis as funding for um, the network and the alliances sort of ran out as Sun was uh, renegotiating with donors around the uh, multi-partner trust fund. So there was a point uh, earlier this year that there was a prospect that, that many of the alliances would um, not have enough money to continue through the year. And what that would mean is you lose all the work that you've done over the last three years. And so we need to become much more intentional about um, you know, the funding streams, the reliability of the funding streams to encourage civil society. Civil society, I think, I think it's fair to say that the Sun Movement is where it is today in country and um, globally because civil society has really made the case. And so I, so as we think about this next phase of Sun, which is really about action at the country level and and um, and really consolidating on the on the um, awareness that has been raised and the and the political will that has been raised, um, now is the phase of really getting to results. And uh, my concern uh, is that without adequate investment in civil society, we will not be able to continue the momentum that has been built up um, at, the at the country level and at the global level. So, and just laying that out as a, you know, I think civil society's um, sustainability is very much linked with the sustainability of the Sun Movement as a whole. And so I will put that out there and uh, stop for now. Thank you so much, Asma. I think that's a really important point and uh, around something that, that really distinguishes Sun um, from, from other initiatives that, that we've seen. Um, so next we'll hear from Denise Leonetti, who directs uh, the MQ Sun uh, Plus project with, with PATH, and will we'll share with us some of her experiences of how things are going right now on the ground with PATH. Thank you, Reed, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, for the past four years, we have been supporting the Sun Movement Secretariat, um, SMS, and working with about 41 Sun countries providing technical assistance. Um, through the MQ Sun Project and now the MQ Sun Plus Project, we have helped build countries, um, helped countries to build and strengthen their governance structures um, to address undernutrition. Um, MQ Sun is funded by the Department of International Development, DFID. Um, DFID has been a longtime supporter and funder of the Sun Movement. Um, MQ Sun is uh, a consortium of five organizations. PATH is the lead, and uh, the Nutrition Works 
the organization that um, helped author the report today is also part of our consortium. But this morning, um, I want to share our experiences with the types of technical assistance and the process of providing technical assistance to Sun countries and some of the lessons that we've learned. We get requests for technical assistance through the Sun Secretariat from the Sun countries. And then we prepare a scope of work jointly with the country team. We spend a lot of time in the space to clarify exactly what is needed and assess how ready the country is to receive the technical assistance. We do a series of conference calls with the Sun Focal Point and key stakeholders. And I'm happy to hear Asma talk about um, civil society alliances because those are one of the stakeholders we'd like to have involved in the um, technical assistance that we're, we're providing. We also negotiate um, a cost share from the country teams. Um, we find that when there's mutual investment in the technical assistance, there's more of a chance that there's going to be uptake um, and continuation of the work after our assignment is um, ends. Countries will often pay for the um, planning workshops. Um, they've offered their staff as in-kind um, cost shares to work with our consultants. Um, and the UN partners have paid for workshops as well and paid for local travel of the consultant team. When it comes to implementation, um, we always include national consultants. Um, our aim is to build uh, local capacity, and the national consultants provide invaluable insight to the local context as well as their um, technical skills. Uh, we find that Sun Country teams often hire our national consultants to provide continued technical assistance after our assignment is over. And then when it comes to technical assistance, um, one of the first things we do is policy and legislation analysis. It's important to know what documentation a country has available and policies, strategies, action plans, costed action plans. And then we also do an assessment of the nutrition data that is available. We examine the quality of the data, how current the data is, um, what gaps are in the data, what types of surveys are being done other than the DHS, like the SMART surveys. Um, it's also not just about having access to the data, but having the ability to properly interpret the data. Um, also having national and subnational data is essential to the planning process. Um, we absolutely agree with the report that nutrition data is one of the areas where there needs more investment and more TA is needed in this area. Another area that's um, important to the process is costing and financial tracking. Um, the activities that are identified in um, the action plans of the common results framework need to be costed. When the, uh, with the Sun Secretariat, MQSUN has reviewed around 40 costed plans from the countries. Um, we are also working with the Secretariat on the assessment of tools and systems for financial tracking. Um, we're working on budget analysis and cost estimations for nutrition sensitive activities. And then along with uh, the Spring Project and OPM and R4D and other groups were um, participants in the Secretariat's community of practice on budgeting and costing. And some of the things that we've learned from this experience is that so, so far, cost estimates for nutrition sensitive actions is very complex. And there is a lot more work that needs to be done in this area. Um, countries' capacity for conducting cost estimations and budget analysis is variable, but it's absolutely essential. Um, so building capacity in this area is, is a priority. 
So working on the common results framework, this is a process as well as a document. Um, it's developed for, um, from multiple stakeholders working towards a common goal and objectives to address nutrition. Um, we've provided technical assistance in about 22 countries that are in the process of developing their, their common results framework. And what we've learned from this experience is that multi-sectoral planning is a new concept for most countries. Getting ministries on board to support the process for nutrition is challenging. And it takes strong leadership from the Sun Focal Point um, to garner the support from ministries to drive the Sun agenda. The focal point has to have political influence to, to drive this process. Um, we've also learned that in some special circumstances, we can actually provide technical assistance remotely. Um, we don't always have to be in country. Um, for instance, in Yemen, where there is a very strong um, focal point, we have done technical assistance without travel um, to Yemen because of the security situation. Um, there is also strong stakeholders there. Um, the stakeholder supports from the World Food Program and UNICEF um, help in this, in this process. We're also looking at Somalia, where we'll also um, be supporting the Common Results Framework, but we also will not be able to travel there, and so we'll be doing that remotely um, as well. And then finally, um, I think it, I would like to mention that there are tools and resources that MQSUN has developed with the Sun Secretariat and other partners, and they are found on the Sun website. Um, specifically, there is guidance notes, um, there's a guidance notes for multi-sectoral planning for nutrition. Um, the last lesson that um, I'd like to share is having common methodologies to do this work is important because there is a need for more donors and more organizations um, to be involved, to help countries, to be a part of the Sun Movement, and these efforts need to be coordinated. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Denise. Um, and then uh, finally, we'll, we'll hear from Carolyn Hart, who directs the Strengthening Partnerships, Results, and Innovations in Nutrition Globally, or SPRING project. Thanks, Reed. Great acronym, isn't it, SPRING? Mm -hmm. Um, and thanks to my fellow panelists for their um, great remarks. Going last on a panel always means you don't know what to say, but I have some notes. Um, and I really, uh, I just want to introduce Spring briefly and say, uh, as Denise said about MQ Sun Plus, it's a consortium activity. It's led by JSI, my organization, but um, implemented as a partnership with Save the Children and Helen Keller International, the Manoff Group, and IFPRI. And um, we were launched at about the same time as Sun. So we've been privileged to work with them, alongside them, and, and with Sun pretty much since its inception. And we were born out of the same impetus. If you can remember what that period was like a couple years after the first Lancet series, when there was so much ferment and excitement and, and energy around things like um, the World Health Assembly targets of 2012 and, and the energy that came with being about a decade into the Millennium Development Goals and, and beginning to think about how we were going to need to reframe those after 2015 and the Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2013 and the reestablishment of the ICN2, the International Conference on Nutrition, and that first Sun Global Gathering in, in 2014. I mean, it was a time of real excitement and hopefulness and focus. And, um, and not to mention the development of USAID's first ever multi-sectoral nutrition strategy in 2014 and its launch in 2015. And, and then the advent of the uniquely wonderful global nutrition reports in 2014. So the, the early part of this decade was a, was a time of tremendous hopefulness. And it kind of makes me giddy to think back about it. And it's, it's like really a, a dizzying litany of conversations and platforms and products and programs that brought attention to nutrition and, and helped us expand our thinking about it as well, to embrace the nutrition-sensitive possibilities 
and to really arrive at a consensus that as a multi-sectoral problem, nutrition needs multi-sectoral solutions. So that's where we find ourselves now, I think, having really just hitting our stride in putting those, that impetus into practice. So Sun and Spring are both about seven years old and we're, I would say we're both really still excited, as excited as we were at the beginning about um, living out the reality of multisexual nutrition. So I, I wanna offer some global and country perspectives or thoughts from, from Spring. And I have several Spring colleagues in the room who, who actually know much more about the nuts and bolts of our engagement with Sun than I do. So if we get to the question and answer period, I hope this is an informal enough group that I can defer to my colleagues to, to answer the tough ones. But, but what we know Sun has added is, um, is really, uh, well, there were national nutrition policies certainly before Sun, but they somehow didn't stick quite so much. So Sun has really helped standardize what nutrition policies need to include and that they need to be multi-sectoral. And, and they've helped to increase participation and buy-in from civil society, as, as Asma mentioned, and, and also to mobilize resources. The Sun Movement has also helped secretariats figure out how to begin to track progress. Um, I, I emphasize the beginning part because I think it's very early days there in successfully tracking progress on nutrition and national nutrition action plans. And Spring has been particularly involved with this from the resource mobilization and tracking angle where um, we know Sun has advocated and helped many countries, Denise was mentioning, help them start to gauge how much money is going toward nutrition, but that the data quality is still really spotty and it varies widely by country. But, but we think that Sun can really be credited with getting this moving. And as also as Denise mentioned, Spring and Results for Development and MQ Sun and Sun are currently co-hosting um, a global technical consultation about nutrition financial tracking, which includes an emphasis on harmonization of tools and collaboration about capacity building in country and at the subnational level in this area. So I think it's, it was really um, great to see that the CSI report emphasizes the, what, what the Sun approach is built upon, that there are localized differences in nutrition, in quotes, nutrition, and the, the causes of malnutrition. So there, it's really critical to embrace that and understand that and reflect that in your programming. Even within one country, one intervention set doesn't begin to solve the problems of anemia and stunting. And so Sun has been instrumental in helping expand the frame there on what is nutrition. Similarly, we think um, Sun and, and the report and all of us agree on the need for disaggregated data to reflect that local solutions are needed for local problems. So at the subnational level, not just having the data, but increasing the capacity and the ability to use it there for planning and strategy and implementation and monitoring, and then adaptation ideally. And Spring's work in a, in a series of studies called The Pathways to Better Nutrition in Uganda and Nepal, the principal author of which who's here is fantastic, Amanda Pomeroy Stevens. Um, those really, really looked in depth at, at those questions of local issues, local data, availability, local capacity, um, and, and then the ability to, to apply and track nutrition financing. So we think Sun is a remarkable glo global movement. Everybody's mentioned the 59 countries and, and all of that. So it, it's, it's really fantastically underway. I think it's important to note we are a USAID funded project and I really wanna call out USAID's leadership and participation with respect to the Sun movement. They've been a really robust collaborator and, and nobody paid me to say that. But I, I, they are a donor convener or co-convener in eight of the Sun countries, and they've been really generous in terms of the research they support, the implementers they support, and the way in which they share and participate in, in Sun efforts. I know improvement is always possible, and, and everybody in this room knows collaboration is not easy, and coordination is not easy. I think that's a point I wanna come back to, but I just wanted to give a shout out to you, Sade. Um, I think this, I, I don't mean to differ with 
um, Denise, on, on this point, but I think, and, and now I'm probably not differing with you, but one of the um, in, most important things I think about SUN is its flexibility as a movement. So while, yes, maybe we want some standardization and harmonization, standardization of approaches and harmonization of tools, one of the great things has been that it's, it's really meant to be a place to open up collaboration and, um, and testing of new methods and then sharing of findings and things like that. And SUN is not really meant to strictly dictate the how-to of multisexual nutrition. So um, in terms of civil society, I would like to mention one thing. I, I think it, it's just going to reiterate something Asma said, but one of the things Spring has encountered is that the expectations of civil society actors at the country level are so high that yes, it's great to have so many civil society organizations engaged, to have had them engaged from the outset, and to rely on them to help make this movement move forward, but are we adequately supporting them with resources, or are we just burdening them with high expectations? And I, I think that bears um, some consideration. I'll share one example that a colleague shared with me when speaking with a, with a, a member of the donor community in a, in a country in, in Africa, asking were they supporting the Sun Civil Society Alliance in that country? And the response was, no, we haven't seen very much come out of them yet, so we can't really put our money there. And that, that kind of begs the question of don't you really need to make some upfront investments when your expectations are this high that they are gonna be the drivers? Um, there are a couple of spring countries, several spring countries where we've been, I should have also mentioned this at the outset, that. Spring is funded both by, with global health support and with monies from the Bureau for Food Security and, and Feed the Future. So at the country level, quite a lot of our um, countries have been majority funded by Feed the Future funds, and there we work in Feed the Future zones of influence, and, and, uh, and um, two of those are Ghana and Bangladesh, which uh, one of which is highlighted in this report. But, there, one of Spring's findings, it won't be really news to you, I think, but one of Spring's findings is the importance of multi-sectoral actions being layered and um, communicated or coordinated and coherent right down at the household level. So in Ghana, we call that the thousand days household approach. And in, in Bangladesh, it was built around our farmer nutrition schools, which took the old um, or the proven farmer field school approach and combined it with essential nutrition actions and essential hygiene actions. So where you're layering um, the WASH and community-led total sanitation efforts and the end to open defecation with nutrition other nutrition interventions and IYCF type interventions at the household level. And in those two countries, while SUN maybe has not been super effective yet in Ghana or super dynamic, I'm not sure if that's fair to say, and in Bangladesh it's been more so, we do think that SUN could become a force for expansion of this kind of learning <clears throat> and that kind of programming. In Kyrgyz Republic, which is another spring country, the SUN partnership is actually quite active, but um, you know, with rotating leadership and good engagement from academia and the ag sector and the health sector and, and community-based organizations and businesses, but the group is informal and it lacks decision-making authority. So while we've had a, a real positive experience with SUN in, in Kyrgyz Republic, we think um, additional standalone funding for them and, and some decision-making authority would give the group more leverage. And then in Nepal and Uganda, where we did our in-depth Pathways to Better Nutrition studies. They were in-depth, prospective studies tracking nutrition financing and nutrition policy and how that plays out. Um, we ended up making 10 recommendations for translating nutrition policy into action. And they're consistent with the SUN principles and with the findings in the report and with the SUN uh, phase two strategy. And I won't mention all 10 of them, but I, I will mention a couple. One is to absolutely take the long view Another is to reach the local level and prioritize bottom-up approaches for engaging and empowering local level stakeholders. Another is to embed nutrition in existing mechanisms for durability's sake, so me exist existing me mechanisms for planning, financing, and monitoring. I know we've all said for better or worse, there's never a ministry for nutrition, and I think actually that's for better. But it does mean you have to rely on existing mechanisms to, to strengthen their um, 
uh, raise their awareness and, and engage them and then strengthen their ability to do the tracking and mobilization necessary for nutrition. And then the last one I'll mention is to invest in the key drivers of change. What, what distinguishes places that are making progress from places that aren't? And two of the most important ones are attention to human resources and attention to effective coordination mechanisms. I think that um, with respect to coordination and collaboration, sometimes it ha happens by serendipity, but mostly it doesn't. As a good colleague of mine at, at WHO said once, you know, everybody loves coordination, but nobody wants to be coordinated. So you really have to invest in the effort that it takes to, to do coordination and collaboration well, and you can't rely on it to, to happen. It has to be sort of planful and purposeful. Um, and for that, I think that Sun really needs to stay the course in, in sort of pushing that agenda, but also learning from where coordination and collaboration have worked better and what has caused that to happen, where throughout the planning and implementation, the policy program planning and implementation cycle have things been effective and where have the bottlenecks been in, in um, preventing effective collaboration. As we look to the future, I would say there's a couple of things that we would love to see Sun possibly able to do more around. One is, I would say, the, the research to action and action to learning processes. Um, that's a great place for Sun to, to really exert its influence, I think. We know there's, there's a big gap in monitoring sort of all the research that's happening around multisexual nutrition. It's happening all over the place. And, and I think the world could use an organization to play a coordination and sharing role in that space. Um, also, are we, the question of are we learning from these many new or new-ish multisexual nutrition action plans? Are we learning the lessons about what's working with them? Are we learning the lessons about where the bottlenecks are and where they fail to live up to their promise? Um, so what kind of coordination or collaboration platforms, information systems, knowledge management and communications channels need to be strengthened to make this work more robust and more efficient and cost effective? And then lastly, private sector. I mean, everybody, everybody knows that's a very tough nut to crack. It's one of the biggest challenges, I think. Um, and we want to see countries step up their efforts to engage uh, private sector businesses on promoting healthy foods, but not only that, also countries then in, from the governance side of things will need to step up in terms of engaging with the private sector to reduce or mitigate or prevent um, the promotion of unhealthful practices in foods, especially things like junk foods and breast milk substitutes for children, and some of the great work that HKI is doing in, in that space is instructive there. And then the very last thing, I think, is to keep up the effort on monitoring and tracking, um, not just finance, but probably especially finance, because you know where you put your money is where your priorities lie, and that actually influences what gets happened. So we think much could still be done to encourage countries to be accountable to the kinds of results there um, that are now being published in the Global Nutrition Reports, and then particularly to meet their financial commitments. So that's a few uh, sort of all over the map perspectives from the Spring Project, and um, thank you very much for the chance to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I want to make sure that we have lots of time for audience questions, but if you'll, if you'll permit me to pose a few myself. Um, Asma, you wear a lot of different hats, and one of those hats has been on a task force with some of my colleagues here on the health team, which I'm happy to see here today. Um, and, and we were talking about some of that work the other day, and, and you were really emphasizing the importance of also paying attention to adolescent girls in this um, broader um, uh, sort of nutrition framing. And I'd love to hear from you um, your thoughts on, on if Sun is doing that, how well that is going, um, and any uh, sort of recommendations um, that you may have for, for more direct engagement with that population. Yeah, I think that was a really exciting opportunity to be on the uh, CSIS task force on women and family health, and that focus on adolescent girls um, really pushed us to think a, a lot about how in the nutrition space we could get more bang for the buck. And it really, with, with um, I think with Sun, uh, there is a huge opportunity, um, and I think this case is being made about we absolutely do need more resources for nutrition, but it's also about doing things smarter. 
and really um, leveraging opportunity, existing opportunities to get more nutrition for existing investments. And adolescent girls seems like a absolutely uh, unique opportunity to prevent stunting right from the get-go. And um, I mean, the more that we're learning about how early stunting sets in um, during pregnancy, you know, really making sure that uh, adolescent girls, young women, um, pregnancy age women are receiving the nutrients they need so that when they are going into pregnancy, they, um, they are healthy to begin with. And um, we know that anemia, it accounts for 40% of maternal um, mortality. And so, you know, there are, and there are, there's a lot of interest in maternal mortality, but we're not thinking about the whole chain and, and um, really leveraging different platforms to reach adolescent girls with the right nutrition at the right time. And so I think that I was really excited by um, being able to think that through um, with the task force and looking at uh, US programs that could do, you know, um, be a platform and uh, that are currently not, um, such as McGovern Dole School Feeding. And, you know, there are existing um, health, health programs and other things that could be, um, you know, broadening its scope to look at nutrition amongst adolescent girls. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so turning to Denise, uh, your remarks raised a, a lot of questions for me, but I'm going to restrict myself. So I have to confess that I, I wasn't aware of the work in conflict settings like Yemen and Somalia. Um, Sun really does put governance and country level, level, country level leadership and ownership um, front and center. And so can you just talk a little bit more about the challenges of working in governments, with governments in these types of environments? Um, is this is this a domain that, that Sun should should engage more? Or I'd just love to hear your thoughts on, on conflict uh, settings. Um, I would say yes. The um, Sun Secretary is very interested in working in conflict um, countries. In fact, we have a, a special assignment that we're doing now looking at that that um, possibility. You know, what what can be done in those conflict countries? But I mean, we found, as I mentioned in Yemen that if you have the nutrition champions, right, if you have a good sun focal point um, who is willing to drive um, the issue for nutrition, you can achieve a, a lot. I mean, we never stepped foot in Yemen, and yet we did, I think, four or five technical assignments with them that moved them forward um, to do in their um, common results framework. The same with Somalia. We're just starting our conversations with Somalia, and they have a very active um, focal person. And um, we're going to use a little different approach with, with them. We're actually um, having them help us identify an institution that we can work with on the ground, right? Because we won't travel there because of the security situation, but we'll be able to provide technical assistance to that institution who will help provide technical assistance on the ground to the, the common results framework. So this whole idea of um, risk countries is one that um, after we finished our work on MQSUN and we had a lot of starts and stops with some countries, and we found that um, at least we felt that it was just that they didn't have the capacity to follow up on, on um, doing, having technical assistance and moving the Sun agenda forward in their countries. And so we asked DFID and the Sun Secretariat if we couldn't choose five or six of those countries that we could actually target for technical assistance. And yes, they'll be high risk. We might not get much for our investment, but at least we can try and see how far we can move them. We may only move them from A to B, but it would be really nice if we actually move them to A to the end. Right? Absolutely, that's something that I'd love to talk to you more about afterwards. Um, I think it's so critical to highlight the importance of, um, of, of chronic malnutrition as well as acute malnutrition in these environments. Um, Carolyn, 
you, you mentioned briefly at the end uh, engaging the private sector and perhaps some, some pause uh, that that gives you. Um, I'd, I'd love to, to hear a little bit more about what you think are our successful strategies for um, making the Sun Business Networks more robust, um, as well as any insights you have into that engagement, also allowing us to address the, the double burden of malnutrition in, in many of these countries where spring works. Boy, that's such a good question, and um, not actually an area that spring has done much work in yet, but I do have a few opinions, I guess. Um, uh, one of the things I think we think is that um, when you're, well, for instance, if you're working one of the ways to engage with the private sector is in, agricul in agriculture and through value chain type projects. And one of the things we've learned there is the need to have much more um, sort of purposeful alignment around a broad view of nutrition and how that is, can be an objective in a value chain project that may or may not be produ uh, producing a nutritious commodity in and of itself, but there are ways to improve the sort of nutrition sensitivity of the agriculture that's practiced. So there's a lot of possibility there for engagement with the private sector in terms of increasing the, um, making agriculture more nutrition sensitive. That's where we've done most of our work. And I actually have a, a we have a little five, five point um, uh, uh, quick set of takeaways about what we've learned in nutrition sensitive agriculture. And that, so I encourage you actually to all look at the nutrition hyphen, uh, the spring hyphen nutrition.org website for, for a wide variety of resources. But um, so in addition to nutrition sensitive ag though, where we've done a lot of work, I think one of the things we are most interested in is promoting a systems view of nutrition that includes the health system and, and ag and livelihoods and social protection, but also the food systems, which is really a private sector domain. Let's be honest, right? Most of us buy, mo most people in the world now buy most of their food. Not everybody, not everyone, not everywhere, but increasingly um, food, the food marketplace is determinative of people's nutrition status. And I think um, that's one of the places where I have most pause, and I think it's where it borders into the concerns about the double burden. I really wish, I'm fond of saying, and it may make some of my colleagues cringe, but I really wish there was a way we could help some of the emerging uh, developing economies, low income economies, skip the step that seems to be essential in the nutrition transition that goes through bad food, bad convenient food. I, we ought to be able to help skip that step somehow and the private sector is gonna be essential if we're able to do that. So I just leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, I, I want to open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, please do raise your hand. We've got some um, colleagues running microphones so that we can make sure that our online um, listeners are also able to hear those questions. Uh, so we can start with the gentleman right here on the aisle, the black coat. Oh, and we'll take uh, two or three at once. So if you still have a question, keep your hand raised for a moment. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having this. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. Excellent comments, but looking at the, the world, we ha we're facing severe climate change, uh, attacks on the agricultural industry and local communities because of climate change and uh, the decrease in quality of the environment. But yet at the same time, we're going to have 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. So how do we combine this where we're increasing the nutri nutritional level, which goes back to Carolyn's point, uh, in the agricultural uh, supply chain, but at the same time to protect local uh, agricultural communities, increase their quality of life so people are staying in the countryside, not having to migrate to the cities and living in you know, less than optimal conditions. And, um, but we have to be very smart about this. We're getting less and less money coming from governments. And the private sector is being more and more challenged to pick up the slack. So how do we balance this so that we, it's really multiple sectorial, but we're looking at these in toto instead of we're doing nutrition, we're doing ag, we're doing environmental concerns, these types of things. It needs to be a mesh of all of this happening on a broad front. I know it's tough, but I think that's how we need to be looking at it. And thank you for being here and read. Very nice job today. Great. Thank you. That's a, that's a big question. Thank you. We can take a couple more. There's a, a lady right here on the aisle in front. Hi. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jenny Davis. I work with Mercy Corps. And so, sort of uh, piggyback off of the previous question, um, what type of efforts are Sun and also Spring looking to do for uh, urban areas? Uh, since half of the population is moving to the cities and that brings out new challenges uh, for nutrition. So I wanted to know if there's any efforts or initiatives that you all have for urban areas. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any more right now? We can take one more. Uh, Emmy in the back. Thank you. That was an excellent panel a pre set of presentations. I really appreciate it. Emmy Simmons from the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition. But my question, I think, goes to, to Carolyn's point about that using and working with existing organizations rather than creating new ones. And yet, Asma talked about providing support in Zambia to setting up a new parliamentary commission to have to address the issues of nutrition. And I think Denise pointed out multi-sectoral approaches, which almost by definition require some kind of a new intersectoral kind of, uh, of organization. So I guess I wanted to go back to Carolyn and kind of challenge you, you know, under, under what circumstances, you know, would you agree with your previous panelists um, that in fact creating new organizations and new coalitions, perhaps not formal organizations, really makes sense to get this message of multi-sector approaches to improving nutrition, to improving food systems, I would emphasize, and nutrition um, really underway. Great, thanks, I mean, so we've got uh, climate change and the burden of population growth, uh, natural resource scar scar scarcity, uh, and rural to urban migration, which then brought us to the question on specific focus on urban environments, uh, and then this question of uh, sort of the supporting existing versus, versus new entities. Um, I think that last one was a little bit geared towards you, you, Carolyn, if you wouldn't mind starting, and I think we can just go down the line. You're welcome to address any of those points. Great, thanks. Um, Emmy, I think you're right. I, uh, our point is to embed the accountability in existing systems and to, to use them and align them because they already have the responsibility for doing some of these things, for tracking resources, for monitoring and collecting information, for publishing data and things like that. So really to make sure that the multi-sectoral um, actions and expectations are embedded in existing structures, but that they are also definitely facilitated by a new way of working, which I don't necessarily think is a new organization, but definitely the sort of coalitions and new ways of collaborating. And, and I, as I sort of went on and on, I think about sort of purposeful collaboration and figuring out what collaboration mechanisms actually work. I don't necessarily think those are new organizations, but they are definitely new ways of working. Um, and then just about urban, I, I will say the only place that Spring has worked in the, in the urban, uh, with an urban focus is in Kyrgyz Republic, and, and um, one of our uh, efforts there has really been focused around um, mass media and social media, or social media in particular, and really uh, it's pretty nascent. It's just taken, taken flight, I guess, maybe in the past year or so. So we haven't had a very, uh, very urban focus yet, but I agree with you that it's coming. And, um, or it's here, it's not coming, it's here. And, and then I'll just take the climate change observation as a comment instead of a question because I do not have an answer. I think you, you went on to talk about the challenge and the need to align the environment, the agriculture, the nutrition, the health, the, the education, and the civil society sectors around this reality, and, and I don't have an answer. I think um, I can address some of the urban nutrition um, questions that you had. I mean, DISID is very interested in, in working in urban nutrition, and they are actually been looking at, you know, sort of what are some of the strategies that we can use to address um, the nutrition situation in urban areas. And of course, that includes looking at market chains, um, food availability, um, urban agriculture and and water access because water has a lot to do with um, malnutrition right from diarrhea and um, and other illnesses and so I think that um, 
you know, it's working with a different governance structure. So it isn't something that you pass down from national, you know, usually goes to provinces. Now you work directly with city governments um, to be able to address um, the nutrition issues. And this is something that's new. It's not what we've normally done, but I think that we're beginning um, to see how important that is. Uh, the only thing I would just add on the climate change question, I, I think as part of the Sun 2.0 strategy, climate change is definitely um, highlighted. Um, so there is growing awareness of uh, the linkages. There is also emerging scientific evidence of the breakdown of nutrition quality of crops as a result of climate change. So, I mean, I think there are huge opportunities here to engage the scientific community um, in, in um, the nutrition work as well, in academia and the nutrition work, and really bolster a research, a research agenda around this that potentially we could act on. Thank you. Um, I think that also uh, helps us to draw out these connections between the importance of, uh, of agricultural research investments for nutrition outcomes um, as well. So let's have another round of questions. If you have one, oh, please raise your hand. Um, the gentleman right here in the pink. Tim Ogbone from Project Concern International, PCI. I want to pull together a couple of things. Carolyn mentioned the private sector and the big nut to crack there. The, uh, the lady uh, from Mercy Corps here mentioned about the urban piece. And the focus of Sun has been very much on the undernutrition. Under but increasingly across the world, particularly in urban circumstances, I mean we see it in the developed world, but increasingly in developing countries, malnutrition by that, I don't mean undernutrition, but eating the wrong foods, having access to uh, calories that do nothing but uh, bad for the people who, uh, who consume them, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And is there anything that the, the Sun uh, movement is doing to begin to look at that aspect too and, and transition to thinking around malnutrition as opposed to undernutrition? Thank you. Let's take a couple more. If you have one, raise your hand. There's a woman uh, in Navy over on the other side of the room. Keep everybody running. Hi, I'm Kate Bishop from Feature Story News. I just had a question that the current administration it wants to slash funding for international projects. How concerned are you about that? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, any more right now? Uh, back on this side, the woman uh, with the red glasses. Thank you. I'm Allison Annette Foster from IntraHealth International, and I have a question for Carolyn. Uh, one of the uh, items you mentioned as important going forward is will be human resources. So I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on that. What kind of human resources, and particularly at the community level, as those frontline teams evolve, what they look like? Thank you. Great. Thank you. So we have. Uh, the broader focus on malnutrition versus just undernutrition, um, the current state of, um, of uh, legislative play on, on resource allocation, um, and then the human resources question. So, uh, Asma, do you want to start on the, on the resources? Yes, so I think it would be an understatement to say that we are really worried about the, the financial, um, you know, the funding situation. Um, it is really heartening that um, the bill that came out of the House um, had the same level of funding for nutrition this year as last year. So that's uh, a sign that there is strong congressional support and buy-in. Um, when the Sun Movement sort of got, got going, funding for nutrition was around 75 um, million in the line item that is for nutrition in the global health account. It's now up to 125 million. And um, over the last several years, it's members of Congress that have been increasing um, over the president's request funding for nutrition. So we, I think there, there are um, strong champions for nutrition on the Hill. 
um, obviously this is a small amount of money. And um, while the US is still the largest donor, um, and funding for nutrition globally has gone up from about 420 million in 2010 to around um, a bill, just under a billion now. It's a drop in the bucket compared to the need and um, the World Bank and um, our results for development have done costing um, studies that, and created an investment framework for nutrition um, that really outlines the need and what the world is uh, providing right now falls far short. But the, uh, I mean, I think we need to continue to make the case that nutrition is a very smart investment. And I think that's a very, um, that's a message that is very well received on the Hill. Um, there was a recent um, hearing on the, on the um, pending or emerging famine um, countries, and nutrition was a big part of that. And I think the, the argument that, um, that the return on investment for nutrition is so high in so many countries was, is very compelling to a number of members of Congress. So I think even in an environment where we're talking about conflict countries and, um, and humanitarian response, there's a case to be made that um, you know, these are really smart investments. Right. I'm glad that you also mentioned the World Bank's great, great leadership in this space with the uh, gray matter infrastructure. Um, you had also mentioned, I think, before we started this morning that the IDA account is also uh, really under threat. Maybe you could say something. Yeah, about I think the House bill cut the IDA, um, the World Bank's IDA account um, quite significantly. So there's, um, hopefully the Senate will um, put that money or restore that funding, but that's something we really need to pay attention to. Great, thank you. Can we just uh, go down the line on, on the other points? Denise, we were looking at you to tell us what Sun's doing about overnutrition. Overnutrition. <laughs> or no? No? All right. No. You don't want to? No, it's just that I, I don't think that they've addressed it directly. I mean, I think it comes from when, um, when we're working in countries and they're doing their common results framework, they're choosing their mm. targets and um, prioritizing what their interventions are. And so it really depends on what the data is telling them. Um, and so there's more discussion, I think, about urban nutrition and overnutrition as well. Um, but we haven't seen that uptake yet by countries. I did my best for you to get an answer. Um, so with respect to HR and human resources for nutrition, it's such an interesting question because when you think about it, what is the nutrition workforce? It's, it's as multi-sectoral as the problem is. And so one of the things that Spring did er earlier on a few, couple of years ago was develop a tool for mapping the nutrition workforce and really trying to identify where those people are who touch and influence and could improve nutrition outcomes. Because they're not all in the health sector by any stretch of the imagination, where most of the uh, emphasis, I think, has been on, on capacity building for, for health, um, human resources for health. Uh, so right now, what we're working on is going to the, lower le the lowest possible level, at the community level, and, and trying to identify the kinds of human resources who, who are in play there, including agriculture extension workers, community health workers, uh, uh, community mobilization types, community development committees, things like that, and really at the community level, identifying the way in which they intersect with nutrition and the things they are doing and could be doing more of. So, so look for that. It's work in progress right now, and we'll, we'll publish it in the, in the coming fiscal year. Thanks for the question. Can I just add to, add to that? Because um, it was interesting that you mentioned um, Zambia um, and the recruitment of 500 um, nutritionists. And we had done some workplace planning with them several years ago, and there were like barely any nutritionists in, in the country, which is what you find in most countries, right? And so hearing that now that they're looking at recruiting um, for 500 nutritionists, 
I, I hope it means that um, they have gone to the universities to start. They have. It's actually really interesting. You can okay. all read about it in the report. Um, <laughs> they, they've set up uh, new degree programs um, for, to, to shore up this pipeline, and it's really interesting. Okay, any, any other questions from the audience? Um, now we have a lot of hands. Um, why don't we take these two women uh, in the aisle here, and we'll get to you after. Hi, Amanda Pomeroy Stevens with JSI in Spring, and I just I wanted to offer a comment on the, the dual burden um, and full spectrum of malnutrition, because I sit on the Committee of Practice for Sun at Resource Mobilization, and as um, the panelists mentioned, we also have a global technical consultation on this. And we have been considering how we might be able to track funding for overnutrition programs as well. And it's not been included yet in the guidance that we've been giving out, but it's under continuing review as we talk about this. And there's one other factor that might shift the way that we start to talk about this as well. You, the WHO just put out their double duty actions for nutrition. It's not any different, really, these six that they've identified, they're not different than many of the nutrition-specific interventions that have already been mentioned, but it, I think it allows us to start to talk about the broader range of benefits that we get from those, and so it will help us advance the advocacy case for investments in those areas. And so I think Sun might be able to start to get tra more traction for those particular actions for the full spectrum of, of reducing mal malnutrition. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Amy Johnson, independent consultant working in um, social justice, empowering women and youth and malnutrition. And I really appreciate the comments and the focus on the whole system and the complexity of the issue, but I uh, actually wanted to zero in on a, um, a comment that Asma made about peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I'm really curious as to how that's working. Is it actually in person? And it, it just, it sounds like it's such a, a wonderful approach to building local capacity and to learning from one another. And I, I'd just love to hear more details on that. Hi, Lisa Nichols from Apt Associates. I wanted to ask how Sun or whether Sun has been able to leverage other platforms and other movements, for example, working with DHIS2 data collection for improving uh, nutrition data, looking at WASH platforms, uh, looking also at malaria. Uh, PMI was using anemia as an indicator. Has Sun been able to leverage in these days of uh, limited resources? some of those other platforms for the data gap and getting better information in particular. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, so the peer-to-peer -peer question and then uh, data for anybody who wants to take it. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer learning has happened in a variety of ways. There have been, um, every year there's a Sun Global Gathering that brings together um, the whole network and um, it's, it's hard even for that to, to bring the civil society um, folks to the global gathering because of financial issues. Um, but that's an opportunity there um, for some learning. Um, there are webinars. There's, uh, HKI has, been lead is doing, has done, I think, recently a webinar on um, breast milk substitutes. So there are opportunities for the, the network to get together across through webinars and uh, conference calls. Language barriers and time, all of those things are factors, but that's been an approach. And then the learning uh, routes, uh, there have been three events. Um, these are regional workshops, so they are, uh, you know, they're helping bring civil society alliances with a shorter distance and hosting them within a region, and also allowing a host country to be able to share their own learnings. I mean, in the case of Rwanda, I think Rwanda was sharing uh, its learning and, ha and uh, how it, uh, civil society and the government uh, are dealing, uh, the government is dealing with certain things, and in you know, that, uh, that direct um, conversation with the government and civil society in Rwanda was very helpful. Um, and then uh, there have been two others this year in, in Nepal and Indonesia. But uh, again, these are things that we really do have to um, invest in. And um, with, with um, the civil society alliances, not everyone, I mean, a few alliances are able to participate. They raise their money to get there. 
um, but you know it's a it's just a small group um, representing a much larger network so there's a lot of training of trainers that happens so that they can go back and 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 doing do some of that training in country as well I, I, well I was going to um, address the peer-to-peer -peer because, um, I mean, it's not only the peer-to-peer -peer learning that um, you do on that technical level, but um, we also find that it works very well with the, um, the country focal points. I mean, when they go to the Sun um, Global Gathering, they also love learning from each other. And in fact, you'll find um, a lot of the uptake that they do on you know, moving forward on their um, common results framework have come from learning from other countries. So peer-to-peer -peer is really important in that process as, as well. And for the data um, question, I think I'm gonna turn to my colleague, Monica, who does a lot of um, data work. She's right here in the front, if she could um, address that. It was about using other platforms. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely, thank you, Denise. Uh, so regarding uh, the data, uh, Sun has a meal advisory group, which is monitoring evaluation, accountability, and learning, which basically host uh, conference calls and have developed a standard set of indicators with the advisory group, uh, which includes members from the civil society, UN networks, and the idea is that use those platforms in country and make countries accountable to report on those standard set of indicators that have been agreed upon by the Sun countries. Hope this helps. Thank you so much. Um, Carolyn, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to make sure we give you a chance to add anything else that you'd like. Nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, I'm sure that uh, our panelists don't mind hanging out for another minute or two if you have a question that we weren't able to get to, and I apologize for that. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us today. And I did also just want to quickly flag, um, uh, as has been noted by the panelists, there, there are so many online resources uh, in this space, um, many webinars, and I, and I can't do the full uh, space of them uh, or span of them justice, but I did, out of my own curiosity, discover the other day an interesting three-part video series on the role of the private sector in India that is on Sun's website that I would recommend checking out um, if you're interested in that particular topic. Um, but with that, I will let everyone go. If you didn't have a chance to grab a copy of the report, uh, it seems that there are more uh, on the way out. So thanks so much for, for coming. <laughs>